South African Biomes. And Environmental Studies. Let's review some important terminology for this section. An organism is an individual living thing. A species is a group of living organisms which have the same characteristics and can breed amongst themselves to produce fertile offspring. A population is then a group of a single species living together in the same area capable of interbreeding with one another freely. A community is more complex. A community represents a number of different populations of different species living in a specific area. And there's a various types of relationships between these organisms. This together then forms an ecosystem, which is the number of different communities together with all the abiotic factors in the area. Well, when we look at ecology, ology always refers to a study. So ecology is the branch of biology where we're looking at the relationships between organisms and their environment. And then these environments can be divided into different biomes. A biome is a major ecological community that cover a large geographical area and is characterized by a dominant type of vegetation. The ultimate source of energy in an ecosystem comes from sunlight. This energy is converted to an organic form using photosynthesis. Producers are photosynthetic organisms that obtain their energy through the photosynthesis of sunlight. Consumers are organisms that feed off of other organisms. They do not produce their own food. Consumers can be either classified as primary, secondary or tertiary depending on which stage of the food chain they are at. For example, a secondary consumer consumes primary consumers but is in return consumed by tertiary consumers. Food chains or webs are useful in showing the direction of flow of energy in a habitat. However, they do not provide any quantitative information. In a pyramid of numbers, usually the higher up in the trophic level you go, the fewer organisms there are. However, there is some significant drawbacks to this method. There is no account taken for size. For example, one tree will count the same as one piece of grass. However, it is quite obvious that a tree can sustain more life than a blade of grass can. The number of individuals can be so great it can be almost impossible to count them. For example, all the grass in a field. Here we see 85 grass poles sustaining a thousand locusts, which can sustain 150 frogs, which can sustain a single hawk over a year. The method that is more reliable than numbers is the pyramids of biomass. At least this one takes size into account. Biomass is the total mass of plants or animals of a species in a given place. Biomass can be unreliable, however, as there are various different amounts of water that can be stored in an organism. Dry mass is therefore measured instead. However, to do this, the organism must be killed. Both pyramids of biomass and numbers can be unreliable as they do not take into account seasonal differences in the amount of organisms present. Here we can find 2,000 grams of locusts can sustain 3,300 grams of frogs which can sustain a hawk of approximately 750 grams in size. <laughs> The most accurate representation of energy flow in a food chain is using a pyramid of energy. Data is usually collected in a given area for a given period of time, for example, a year.
This is more accurate than using biomass, since different organisms may have the same mass, but one may have more fat, for example, than the other, and so will have more energy. The energy flow in this type of pyramid can be measured in calories per hectare per year. For example, here we see a high amount of calories for the grass poles and a high amount of calories for the locusts because it is over a period of a year that they are sustained. The savanna biome stretches from the Kalahari in the northwest to the low felt in the northeast and southward to the low-lying areas of KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape. The summer rainfall area has extremely hot temperatures in summer and cold winters with little to no rain. The infertile porous soil allows the water to drain away causing it to lack in nutrients. The predominant vegetation is grasses and trees. The trees include baobab, mopani, camel, camel thorn and monkey thorn. The frequent felt fires prevents the trees from dominating and encouraging the germination of seeds. The savanna is well known for the wildlife that it has, which includes the extremely well known big five, the rhinoceros, the elephant, the lion, the buffalo and the leopard. There are also many types of birds, such as hornbills, flycatchers, woodpeckers and shrikes. Livestock such as cattle graze on the different kinds of grasses. The grassland biome covers the high central plateau of South Africa, the interior of KwaZulu-Natal and the mountainous areas of the Eastern Cape. It has a high rainfall and thunderstorms with hail are common in summer. Frost is common during the winter time. The deep and dark soils are fertile, up, uh, with the upper layers are very fertile. Sweet grasses, which have a high nutritional value and serves as an important food source for animals, grow in the less acidic, more fertile soil, while sour grass grows in the less fertile acidic soil and have little nutritional value. Usually, felt fires occur every year and consequently, there are few woody trees. The grasses are adapted to survive these fires. Animal life in the past included large herds of black wildebeest, blessbok and eland. But now these animals only survive in nature reserves and on game farms. There is still an abundant bird life in the area, which mainly includes seed eaters. The black busted or korhan, the blue crane and the helmeted guinea fowl are examples. There are many different kinds of antelope, including blesbok, ritbok, grey rebok, eland and springbok, plus a few of the bigger cats such as the leopard and the lion. The biome covers about 24% of South Africa's surface area and woody plants are either absent or extremely rare. The Nama Karoo extends over the wide central plateau of Western Africa. It is an area of transition between the Cape Flora in the south and the tropical savanna in the north. It has warm, dry, semi-desert climate with sandy soil that has little nutrition. The soil is rich in lime and forms a thin layer over the rocks. The plants are mostly grasses and small shrubs, such as wild gentian, sweet thorn and the blue karoo daisy. Sheep farming is the main agricultural activity. 
Other animals occurring in the Namakuru include bat-eared foxes, ostriches, spring hares, tortoises and the endemic riverine rabbit. The endemic or near-endemic bird species includes Sclater's lark. The succulent karoo extends over the arid western part of South Africa, including Namakuland and the Ruchtersveld leading up the west coast. It is a winter rainfall area with very hot and dry summers. The soil is sandy with little to no nutritional value, even though it is rich in lime, forming a thin layer over the rocks. The plants in the biome are adapted to extremely dry summer conditions and include succulent plants which have thick fleshy leaves to store water and others with small leaves and thorns to reduce water loss through transpiration. Annual plants survive in this dry period by germinating, growing, flowering and setting seeds during the moist winter and spring. They evade the dry periods by being stored as seeds. The plants are mostly small succulents. Animals such as the Dasi rat, Namakwa dune mole rat, barking gecko and the Cape horseshoe bat is often found in this area. Large areas of colorful Namakwaland daisies bloom for a short period of time and is a well-known tourist attraction. Unfortunately, this also leads to overcollection of endemic plants and bad management which is causing damage to this well-known landmark. Further damage to the Nama Karoo and Succulent Karoo is mainly caused by sheep overgrazing. The thicket biome stretches from the west coast of South Africa to KwaZulu-Natal with the largest part situated in the Eastern Cape. The climate varies because it extends over such a large area. The soil is often shallow and varies from sandy loam to sandy clay soil that is rich in lime. The vegetation includes shrublands to low forests with many evergreen and succulent trees and shrubs. Many of the plants have thorns to protect themselves against grazers. Examples of plants that occur here include the Speckworm, Euphorbia, Cape Honeysuckle and Plumbago. The animal life includes the African elephant, kudu, vervet monkeys and bushbuck, with tertiary consumers such as the leopard, and spotted bush snake hunting. Fynbos occurs exclusively in the southwestern and southern parts of the Western Cape. The climate is cold with wet winters and hot dry summers with strong winds and regular fires. The soil is sandy and alkaline in the coastal areas but further inland it becomes more acidic. In the lowlands the soil is more fertile and neutral. Evergreen plants and shrubs with hard leaves is the basic vegetation of this area. It includes proteas, iricas and restios. There are very few trees and grasses in this area. Low shrubs with fine leaves such as the iricas and leafless, tufted grass-like plants such as restius are the main plants, with proteas growing into large bushes. Trees are rare and grasses are small part of the vegetation. The fainbos plants only reproduce through seeds. They depend on small mammals such as birds, such as the Cape sugarbird for pollination. It has 68% endemic plants found only in very small areas. 
That is why this is a World Heritage Site. and unmentioned forest by homes are so interesting that I decided to make a whole video just on them. So like and share and subscribe and ring that bell so that you will be notified when these new videos will be published. And also check out these videos that I have made that includes more on environmental studies for the future.